And first, first I'll start off, how many people know a surefire way to tell a spotted bass from a large mouth? There's one simplest way to check, because a lot of times a spotted bass looks like a large mouth. Several times I've had taken people fishing and they say, oh, that's a nice large mouth. I say it's a spotted bass. The easiest way, when you catch a fish and you're not sure, you hold that fish by the lower lip and you look in his mouth. And in the center of his tongue, if he's a spotted bass, he will have a patch of teeth. You can take your finger and just brush it gently across his tongue. If it feels rough, it's a spotted bass. That's the surefire way to know whether you caught a spotted bass or a largemouth. One of the neatest things that the fishing game have done for us out here, especially in the North State, is they have introduced spotted bass to our fisheries. I'm a longtime resident of Lake Oroville, and I can remember when I was 15, 16 years old, I'd go out on that lake during the winter time, this very time, January, February, we would fish two or three days in a row. And if we had two or three bites in a two or three day period, we were doing good. I can remember fishing some team tournaments out there to where if you caught one bass, you made the money. And not enough people caught fish to pay 20 spots out of 100 boats. That's how tough fishing used to be at Lake Oroville in the winter time. But since the introduction of spotted bass, their metabolism is on a different time schedule and framework than a large mouth. Water starts getting around that 52, 53 mark. Large mouth, they start going a little dormant. As soon as it hits about 48, 47, large mouth basically quit playing. The only time they will eat is when they absolutely have to. And they can get by about once a week eating. A spotted bass, his metabolism is a little more fired up than a largemouth, and that's why we have such great winter fisheries. I mean, I can literally go out on any given day in the winter out on Oroville and catch close to 50 bass in a day. And that is so much fun to have a lake basically all to yourself. There's not water skiers out there. There's not pleasure boaters. It's like you're on your own private little lake. And this also works at Folsom, Shasta. It's the same scenario. Anytime you have spotted bass that are the predominant fish in a fishery, you have that opportunity to catch those fish. What I'm tossing here is a jig. This is one of my favorite baits. This particular style of jig is my favorite jig to fish for spotted bass. What it is, is it's a football head. When I'm fishing jigs on Oroville, 99% of the time I'm going to throw a football head jig for a couple of reasons. One, all the weight is forward on this jig. A lot of times we're dragging these jigs into 30 to 60 foot of water range. I'll fish either a half ounce or a three quarter ounce. Those are the two basic jigs that I normally throw. But with the lead forward it keeps that jig in contact on the bottom and I'll kind of explain that in just a minute why you want that and that's so important. The other reason I like a football head jig is when that jig sets on the bottom, it sets there at a 90 degree angle. And when I say that, I mean that hook is straight up, 90 degrees, it's in a stinging position. And every time you start to drag this, here I can't get enough line out. You know, normally when we're dragging these, it's quite a ways away from the boat. What will happen is you start tugging on this eyelet and the back of that jig starts raising up a little bit. As I pull that line, the tail of that jig goes up. And that's exactly what a crawdad does. That's actually the last thing a crawdad does when a bass is following him. He'll raise up and throw his claws up and the rest is all dark from there on out. That fish just ate him. That's what that jig does when I drag it. It'll raise the tail of that hook up in a stinging position and about 90% of the time that hook will be driven right in the nose and you won't lose the fish. Every now and then you'll get one in the corner of the mouth but majority of the time he'll be punched right in the safe zone where it's real tough for him to throw it. I keep my jig colors real basic. Normally I'm throwing a brown jig. The only time I might vary from that if the water is extremely dirty. If it's real muddy and it's after a rainstorm or something, I might go to a black and brown jig or a black jig. Or I might start throwing a little bit of chartreuse in there. 
but probably about 80% of the time, I'm throwing a straight brown jig with a brown trailer. A lot of people, when they throw jigs, they throw pork. I do fish some pork, but with spotted bass, it seems like if I have a little more action on my jig, I get a few more bites. A pork, piece of pork, normally there's no twist or curls to it. It normally just kind of lays there. And when I'm fishing this jig, I'm dragging it along the bottom. I'm not hopping or swimming it. I'm just kind of slithering it along the bottom. I like to throw plastic trailers, whether it's a twin tail grub or a single tail. I probably throw, majority of the time, a single tail, unless I'm trying to bulk up my jig a little bit to slow it down. What I'll do is I'll take a single tail grub, whether it's a Yamamoto or a Kalen grub, those, they all have great colors. Again, I stick with real earth tones, browns and greens. When I rig that grub on that jig, what you want to do is you want to make sure, you'll see that grub has a hook tail. And here's my jig in the hook. I picture that jig that's laying on the bottom like that. I want the tail of this grub to go the opposite way the hook goes. So what I'm saying is I want the hook of the grub to go towards the bottom. And what that does is that creates more action on that jig in two ways. There's my hook pointed straight up and then the grub tail is pointed down. So what happens, a lot of times if you rig it the other way, when I make that initial cast, that tail won't swim or kick or displace any water. With it rigged this way, it meets the most resistance as it falls, so it's gonna have a lot of action. The other thing that I like about it is as I drag that along the bottom, and I'm fishing those little muddy points and that, where those crawdads are rooting around, as I kind of drag that along the bottom, that tail is kind of sweeping the bottom and kicking up a little bit of dust. And you know, you just kind of picture it in your mind. That's kind of exactly what that crawdad's doing in the winter. He's kind of stumbling along. He may just scurry just a little bit or move, and he kicks up a little dust. That's what I want that jig to imitate. The one thing, the best piece of advice I can give you when you're fishing jigs in the winter, especially for spotted bass, and this goes true with largemouth, is a lot of people, everybody's used to fishing jigs and worms with their rod tip pointed up, going from like nine o'clock to 11 o'clock. When the water's cold, the last thing I want that jig to do is start hopping and skipping across that bottom at a good rate of speed. I want it to be as slow as possible. So how I'll fish that jig, I'll make my cast, I'll let it go out on a slack line, and a lot of times I'll just start stripping the line off of my reel to make sure it goes straight down. Especially if I have a point or something I'm trying to target, a rock pile, I want to make sure it falls on the other side so I can cover the whole piece of structure. I'll take my rod, and I won't fish it vertical. I'll point it down towards the water at like a 45 degree angle, and I'll fish that jig sideways. I'll just move my rod tip to the side in a sweeping action, reel up the slack, and just kind of sweep it along. That keeps that bait on the bottom. The other thing, if I'm fishing this rod up here in the air, what happens if there's a little bit of a breeze or it's a windy day? The more line you have exposed from your rod tip to the water takes away the sensitivity. You're gonna have better feel with the least amount of line exposed. If it's in the water, that helps condense that line and it's gonna telegraph a strike. So if I only have two or three foot exposed to the air, I'm gonna have, I feel, half again as much sensitivity as if I have eight, six or eight foot of line exposed. The other thing with spotted bass, they are notorious for coming up and grabbing a bait, peck at it, spit it, peck at it, and spit it, they're almost playing with it. My advice or the remedy to that problem, and I do this with all my jigs, worm fishing, everything, is if I feel that bite, I'll start to reel and wait till I feel the weight of the fish. Because a lot of times, I'll have a fish pick up a jig or, or kind of jerk it around or bite at the skirt two or three times before he'll commit to it before he'll actually take that jig 
and hold on to it. So if, if I'm fishing it along and I get bit and I swing and move that jig three or four foot, chances are that fish might lose interest in it. But if I can leave it right in front of him and just keep twitching it along, he's going to continue to keep interest in it and eventually commit. One of the variations I'll do when I'm jig fishing, if I have an area, say I'm in a flat or a particular point, and my beater says there's plenty of fish down there, I've caught three or four fish, all of a sudden it's slowed down. One of the quickest remedies you can do to generate a couple more strikes is not take your jig away, but just add a little color to it. And chartreuse is probably the most productive strike indicator, or, or I, how do I want to say this? I want to say it's going to antagonize him is the best way. It's going to antagonize him the best. Chartreuse, and I, I prefer dip and dye. I brought a chartreuse pencil for the simple fact I don't want to spill a tub of chartreuse dye in this bass bin and have to stay late tonight and clean it up. And one thing I might recommend too for you guys that fish these pro-ams or you go fishing with your buddy on a team tournament is buy a chartreuse pin. Don't buy a jug of chartreuse dye. Chances are your fishing partner he's going to have the dip and dye. And if it's going to get spilt you want it to be his dye. You don't want it to be your chartreuse dye all over your buddy's carpet or your fishing partner's carpet. What this little bit of chartreuse on that tail will do is it's just going to amplify the movement. Every time I move that jig a little bit and swim it along, that tail's going to move back and forth, but now it's like it's got a little road flare back there waving it around. It just, I get to move that jig a little bit, but I get to amplify its movement with that chartreuse tail. Normally when I'm fishing these jigs, I throw it on 10 pound P-line CXX, super tough line. It has a small diameter. It, it breaks at like 16 or 17 pounds. Has really good abrasion resistance and it doesn't stretch a whole lot. And that's real important when you're fishing in 40 to 60 foot of water is that line stretch. When you start to reel down and that loads up and you swing, you don't want a bunch of line stretch. But that's that's pretty much covers my jig fishing. The other thing is, is I'm a firm believer in scents. Whether it's garlic, some type of anise oil base or anything. In the winter time, you can't get hurt fishing with a scent. Put something on your bait. It's not gonna hurt. One of the other th things we like to do, if I'm fishing that jig, and all of a sudden I start coming across a lot of brush and I'm seeing those fish suspend up in the brush piles a little bit versus being right on the bottom. I like to fish a Texas rig worm and I fish this probably just a little bit different than most people. One, I'm going to fish tungsten bullet weights. This particular weight that I have on here, I like to throw 3 16 ounce. That's probably what I fish 90% of the time, no matter the depth, just because it has a nice profile and I never lose contact with it. If it's a super windy day or something, I'll go with a heavier weight, a quarter ounce. But 90% of the time, if I can get away with it, I'm gonna throw 3 16 And I talked about tungsten. What happens is that particular weight presents a real small profile. A lead weight would be about twice the size of that. The other thing with tungsten weights, it's, it's going to let you te kind of telegraph your bottom composition if you're dragging that particular bait on the bottom. It's more dense, it's harder, it's going to telegraph whether you're in rocks or mud easier back to you. And that's very important. A lot of times those spotted bass, they'll want, they will prefer mud over rock or rock over mud or into the brush. So I talk about, I'm going to shake this worm in some brush. And what I'll do different than most people is everybody, we're all familiar with brass and glass. I still use the glass bead. I'll slide that tungsten weight on there. I'll put a glass bead on there. I'll rig a wide gap hook. I'll throw a, like a six or seven inch robo worm on the back. 
Again, I keep my colors real basic. It's going to be a crawdad color if I'm fishing in a crawdad area. If I'm fishing suspended fish or something, and like treetops way off the bottom and they're shad prevalent, I'll throw like a hologram shad or a fuchsia shad in robo worm. But what I'll do is I'll rig that. The number one problem people have when they're Texas rigging this particular bait in a brush is what happens is as this goes through the brush and you kind of slither it across stumps and whatnot, and, and what we have is a lot of uh, a lot of growth from the drought years that we had, and we have brush about four or five foot high, bass love them, and they will suspend just about midway in it. If I can take this particular bait and suspend it in that tree and shake it in front of them, I'll get a few strikes. But what happens when you're fish, fishing a Texas rig is number one thing that will happen is this particular worm or hook, it'll get hung up on a piece of brush and then you're going to lower your rod tip and that weight's going to go down to the bottom and you're going to shake that weight around and that worm's just hung up here in the bush. You're going to lift up and you're going to think you're fishing this real good. Well, you are fishing it real good. The problem is, is the worm's not behind it. You're just fishing that weight and that bead. So what I do to remedy that problem is I take a standard piece of line. You know, you'll have it laying all over your boat from retying all day long. I'll shake this worm on six pound. Again, it's P line, CXX, copolymer line, super tough. I use six pound test just for the feel and it has a super small diameter. I feel I get more bites. I would rather get a few more bites and actually lose a fish than not get the bites at all and have the opportunity to pull him out of the tree or the bush. I have a real high success rate with this particular line. But what I'll do is I'll take that piece of monofilament that I picked up off my deck. Normally I'll use like 10 pound test. If I've been fishing six pound, all I'll do is I'll take an extra long piece of six pound test and I'll just double it up. And then I'm just going to tie a regular square knot around my main line. Just a regular overhand knot, cinch it up, and cut the tag ends off. And what that does, is I know you can't see it, but there's a little, little knot of line there that I can slide up and down that line. There's my weight. It stops when it comes to that piece of line. I'll take this knot, I'll slide it down so it's either two or three inches above my worm. So now when I get in that bush and I lower my rod tip, that weight hits and it drags that worm back down with it. So now I'm not just fishing a weight there by itself. I have the bait trailing right behind it. Really good method to keep your bait next to your weight so you're in contact with the bait at all times. And this works great when you're flipping. I mean, this isn't just a spotted bass technique. I do this when I'm flipping baits on the Delta or Clear Lake on 25-pound mono. I'll just take a piece of 10 or 12-pound line, tie it around it above the weight, and that way that weight hits that, and I can still use like brass weight or glass bead or give my worm more action. I don't like to peg my weights. It kind of kills the action of the bait a little bit, and you also run the risk of damaging your line. If you're using toothpicks, sometimes that'll pinch your line. If you use a rubber type stop, it'll take away the action. Your weight actually creates a little bit of movement and extra action on the worm. Now, if I'm just fishing in open water, this is probably my go-to bait that I love to fish. This is so much fun to fish this particular bait. Dart head fishing, everybody's familiar with that. I do it just a little bit different. In the winter time, I don't like to throw dart heads. I like to throw round heads. For the same reason I like to throw those football jigs. The weight is forward. And what that does is that helps keep that bait in contact with the bottom. It creates a little more resistance when it hits the water and the bottom and it slows things down. A dart head, when you lift up on a dart head, it has a tendency to swim a little bit faster and further than a round head. This particular bait is called a zipper grub. It's a neat little bait. It has a rib side. 
Robert Lee basically has made himself a career with this big brother of this bait called the zipper worm. This is a miniature version of it. It's a little paddle tail. They also make it in curl tail. I'm partial to the paddle tail. And when they mold this bait, they put a groove in the tail and you're able to tear the tail apart and kind of give it a little pincher effect like a crawdad. Watch what happens when this bait, every time this bait hits the bottom, those pinchers separate. Every time I shake it or move it, they'll open up and they'll come back together. If I'm just searching for fish and it's fairly clean banks like rock or clay banks, I like to take my boat and I'll just start cruising down the bank and I'll pitch that bait out in front of me in anywhere from 5 to 20 foot of water. I'll throw it on a 3 16th ounce round head and I'll just shake it a little bit and kind of drag it and then just let it set. And I'll keep my boat moving along and as I, I'll fish my way up to that bait. And a lot of times you'll go to lift up and all you'll feel is a little bit of a sponge weight. Again, I won't just rear back and swing the hook. I'll just start reeling and I'll wait for that rod to load up to right about there before I just give it a little tug. Because a lot of times with that tail opening up and everything, they're just going to come up and they're going to grab that tail. And I'll give it a little pre bit of pressure and they're going to let go. And I'm just going to drop it right back down and I'm just going to give it a couple of quick shakes. Hopefully they're going to come in and tag it. What I'll do with this, same deal. If I happen to pull up on a point or a piece of structure, rock pile, I catch a few fish, it slows down for me a little bit. First thing I go to is that dip and die. I'm going to dunk the tail and do it chartreuse. And you'll be surprised, even with green baits and brown baits, it amplifies that bait just a little bit different and you'll catch a few more fish. Oroville, there's a gentleman named Aaron Martins that had made drop shot and famous out west here. He was fortunate enough to go to Japan and learn this technique and he came to Lake Oroville is where it had its debut and he won the tournament drop shot and the majority of us had no clue what drop shot and was. Well since then I think everybody and their brother knows about drop shot. But again, I fish it probably a little bit different than the majority of the people. I believe spotted bass fishing that your better fish are one or two places. They're either on the bottom rooting out crawdads or they're chasing trout. Your better ones. And I'm talking about your three and a half on up fish. If that's why I rig my drop shot with two hooks. Because what I like to do is I like to put a crawdad colored worm on the bottom because I don't want to miss that bigger bite, especially if I'm in a tournament. And then I'll rig my shad colored worm on top. Now when I rig this, I recommend that you don't go more than about six inches away from your weight. It seems to lose its effectiveness with the crawdad colored deal, unless you're fishing largemouth. Now it's just the opposite for me when I drop shot. Catching largemouth, it seems like the higher up my worm that I put, the less bites I get. If I keep that bait within a half a foot of the bottom, I get a lot more strikes. But now when I'm fishing, I meter a bunch of fish, or actually I'll meter the bait and then start fishing them. And I'll use a shad colored bait on top. This is a Robo. Again, it's a four inch bait. It's in hologram shad. I like to throw a lot of four inch worms. I don't limit myself to just a four inch worm. A lot of times what I'll do is if you need a quick limit or you need a couple of fish real quick, I'll go to the four inch worm or I'll throw like a body shad or an FX worm, which is a little smaller bait. And I'll catch those couple of fish. And then I'll, I'll go back to and I'll throw a six inch worm. Everybody thinks that you know, drop shotting is all finesse and it's got to be little itty bitty baits. When I won that tournament at Oroville this last fall, I was drop shotting six inch worms. And I believe that was the difference is I was fishing around people every day. We'd have four or five boats around each other and all of us were catching fish 
just every now and then I caught a little better fish. And I think it was because I was throwing a bigger bait. One of the number one problems that people have drop shotting is line twist. I mean, you the first thing you'll do is you watch people fish it. They make a cast, they start fishing it. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to reel it up real quick and make another cast. Watch what happens when I reel that bait in at a rapid rate. That Those worms start spinning, they helicopter. If you can just keep it in mind to reel it up slow, you'll save yourself a lot of grief. That's one way to get rid of that line twist. The other thing is if you can do it, throw it on conventional tackle. That way when you're using your spinning rod and it does get a little bit of twist and you make that cast, and there goes a bird's nest out the guides and it gets wrapped around and you're cussing to yourself and it gets pretty ugly. You don't have that problem with conventional gear. One of the other things you can do, and a lot of people I've noticed, quite a few more people are starting to do this, is you don't necessarily have to rig that worm through the nose. You can rig it wacky style and it'll actually give it a little different action. You'll notice when you rig it through the nose, you get a wave in action when you're drop shotting. If you wacky rig it, it almost makes the bait look like it's jerking around, like it's crippled. I like fishing a drop shot rig, wacky rig, better than I do a standard through the nose. He couldn't say no to it. That's your best scenario if you can catch two at a time. The worst scenario is, is it's two three pounders and they decide to go opposite ways. When I throw this rig, I highly recommend that you use either fluorocarbon line or fluorocarbon coated line. I like to throw fluoro clear. I'll fish eight pound test. It helps make the line invisible in the water. The thing about fluoro clear line versus fluorocarbon is it's a little more limp. It doesn't keep a memory as much as fluorocarbon does. And again, when you're drop shotting, very important to not have a bunch of twists in your line. You lose the feel, you'll lose the action of the bait. When I drop shot, I like to shake my worms on a slack line. I don't hold it real tight and just start shaking. I'll let that bait settle down a little bit, twitch it, let it settle a little bit, and then just twitch it again. And what will happen, when I first started drop shotting, I didn't have the right rod, and I definitely didn't have the right technique. We've all been taught to just swing to the moon when we get bit. Drop shotting, that's the number one no-no. You do not, at all costs, swing to the moon and start swinging away and setting the hook hard. I talked about I didn't have the right gear. Very important to have a real limber rod. This particular rod would probably make a great kokanee trout rod. That's how that would work. That's how limber it is. Again, what I'll do, I'll shake that worm. I get bit, all I'm gonna do is just start reeling. And I don't even set the hook at all when I'm drop shot because the majority of the time my hook is exposed through that plastic. As soon as that fish bites that bait, he's got the hook in his mouth. All I have to do is apply a little bit of pressure so if he opens his mouth, that hook just slides right on in. And I'll just start reeling. That's all I'll do. Now on the dart head or the Texas rig worm, I will give them a little pop. But on drop shot, I do not set the hook at all. I just let the rod do the work. And you won't lose as many fish if you'll do that. I take guys fishing all the time and I'll see them back there and all of a sudden, oh, I'm bit, and they'll give it a little tug and they'll reel up a little bit and all they did is they pulled that bait just that much further out of its mouth and caught just a little bit of skin and they get the fish right next to the boat. Oh boy, he's barely hooked and there goes the fish. Done. Another method that works real well on Oroville is ripping. Just a little bit ago, you had the master of ripping up here telling you all about it. I'll throw my two cents in on it. 
This is probably my favorite way to fish reaction baits on Oramil. I others of fishing a reaction bait, I want to throw a rip bait just because it's almost like worm fishing. And when I say that, I'm going to talk about hang time of the bait. In the winter time, very important. Hang time is everything. And hang time is how long I let that bait sit there. I refer to spotted bass a lot of times like a house cat. You have to tease them into striking. And when I say that, it's like everybody that has a house cat always grabs a piece of yarn or a string and starts waving it around and that cat what he'll do is he'll get around the couch and he'll start creeping on that string and he'll twitch it a little bit and he'll get a little bit closer you twitch it a little bit more and he jumps on it I feel that's exactly what spotted bass do whether you're fishing the bait on the bottom or you're fishing a reaction bait this particular bait here is called an Excel jerk we have a bait fish in Lake Oroville called a pond smelt and this really helps our fishing. In the winter time, threadfin shad, they normally sound. They go super deep. And the majority of the fish follow those bait fish. That's their food source. They follow them super deep. We don't like to fish that deep. At Oroville, pond smelt are comfortable in the winter time, whether they're in five foot of water and 47 degrees, or if they're in 100 foot of water. It just doesn't seem to affect them like it does threadfin. So therefore, it keeps our bass in a wide range. So we can throw a lot of reaction baits and catch them, or we can fish deep. We can drop shot them or drag jigs and catch them. This particular bait, again, it looks like a pond smelt. Anytime the water's clear, and that's my best advice to somebody when they say, well, what kind of colors do I throw? The cleaner the water, the natural the bait. The more natural you'll want that bait to look. The dirtier the water, you want to go on the other extreme. You want it loud, obnoxious. And when I throw this, what I'll do is I'll, I like to position my boat in about 40 foot of water. Or I'll, I'll position the boat, as I should rephrase that, a far away from the bank that I can cast. I want to be able to cast that bait up into the shallow and I'm going to work it, I'm going to give it like three quick rips to get it down and I'm just going to let it sit there. And when I stop the rip, I want a slack line. And my best advice to you is don't watch your rod, don't look at the ducks out on the water, look at where your line enters the water. Say this rod is your fishing line. Where I want to focus is right there, where it enters the water. Because a lot of times your strike is going to be when it's stopped and just hanging there. And all you're going to see is a little jump in your line, or that line where it enters, that V, it'll just kind of move a little bit. That fish just grabbed that bait. Again, reel down, wait till it loads up, and give him a little tug. When I fish any type of reaction bait, whether it's a jerk bait, or a spinner bait, or even topwater baits, I use a fiberglass rod. A lot of people complain, well, you lose a lot of feel with fiberglass. That's almost a good thing. Because if I'm ripping that along and I'm moving it and I feel him tick it, I actually want to hesitate a little bit and let that fish turn away from me and get moving in the opposite direction before I load that rod up. Same with spinner baits. I want that fish to have time. His initial bite, I want him to have it all the way in his mouth before I set the hook. The other plus side to fiberglass rod is when you fight that fish, a graphite rod, what makes that rod so sensitive is when you tug on it, it actually pulls back and tries to self right itself. That's what gives them the sensitivity. Fiberglass rods don't have those properties. If I take this rod, set it in the corner where it's bowed, and pick it up next week, it's going to have a curve. It'll take a set, and it'll have that big curve in it. Very forgiving, real important. That bait has treble hooks. If that fish is next to the boat thrashing around, that rod just acts like a shock absorber. And that's what I want. I feel I've won a lot of money throwing reaction baits using a fiberglass rod when a lot of people were out there in the parking lot at the end of the day crying about the fish they lost. When I throw rip baits, 
I like to throw them on 8 to 10 pound test. Again, I'm going to throw it on CXX, real durable line, but a small diameter. I can get a little extra depth on it. It's a stop and go action. Normally, I'll just give it three quick rips. I'll let it set. And before I do my other three rips, I'm just going to give it a twitch. And a lot of times, you'll get a strike right then. Because that fish has followed that bait. He got up right behind it. And the last thing he saw that bait do was take off in three quick rips. So now he's thinking, well, do I want to eat it or do I want to watch it again? You twitch it, it moved, he amped up, but it didn't move far. He goes ahead and grabs it. The other thing, fish and spotted bass, the best word of advice, like with rip baits, is pay attention to the water temperature. If the water temperature is on the fall, that's what I want that rip bait to do. I want it to slowly fall. If the water temperature's on the rise, I want that bait to slowly rise. If it's been stable, say it's in January, we haven't had any temperature changes, I want that bait to be neutral. You can accomplish this a couple of ways. There's several products out. There's suspend dots. We have lead wrap. You know, you can buy at fly shops and add to the hooks. What I'll do is, I like using the suspend dots or the strips, but I don't like putting it on the belly of the bait because a lot of times that can offset your bait and take away the action. I'll take it and start wrapping it around the hooks and stick it. Real small profile, you barely know it's there, but yet I'm getting some weight added. The other thing you want to watch for is as you start adding weight to a bait, is you want to go next to your boat and give it some twitches make sure that bait stops level because the last thing you want that bait to do is you don't want to get too much weight out on the end and when you stop ripping it it sits like that what happens you give it a little twitch the bass comes up he hits it he can't get any hooks or the other scenario is is you get it nose heavy now it's sitting like that this is the good part he hits it he wears it on the outside of his face you get to fight him all the way back to the boat. That's the biggest spotted bass I've ever caught. And about then the hooks rip out because he never got it in his mouth. He was wearing it on the outside. If it stops level, he'll come up. He has a better opportunity to grab that whole bait and get it in his mouth and take it. Now my second choice of reaction baits for spotted bass is a spinner bait. And I'll grab this on stormy days or first thing in the morning. A lot of times people don't realize that water temperature may be 47, 46 degrees, but the fish are really affected by light. There are always some shallow bass or shallow spotted bass, I should say, first thing in the morning on Lake Oroville, Lake Folsom, Shasta, anywhere there's spotted bass somewhere first thing in the morning there's going to be some shallow fish i will grab this bait again i'm going to throw it right up on the bank and i'm just going to do a slow medium retrieve i might actually twitch it a little bit on the way back but i kind of want to keep it on contact to the bottom and when i say i'll twitch it if i run it into something then i'll give it a quick twitch if i bounce it off something i'll twitch it that'll create a strike again it's like teasing that cat the number one complaint that everybody has when they're fishing spinner baits for spotted bass is they're biting at it, I'm missing them. They're doing one or two things. If you're getting bit on a spinner bait and you're not hooking the fish, they're either biting the blades or they're just crashing it or they're coming up and they're just nipping the skirt. I personally do not like throwing stinger hooks because this bait out of the package is real weedless. I can take this thing and I can reel it pretty much through anything. It's weedless. The wire frame and the blades protect the hook. If I take a stinger hook and put it on, all of a sudden I have the hook sticking out there. It's not so weedless. The first thing, if I get bit a couple of times, I'm going to do is I'm going to take my skirt on that spinner bait and I'm going to pinch it down and I'm going to go right behind the hook. 
and I'm going to take my scissors and cut it off right at the hook. So if that fish comes up behind that bait and starts nipping at it, he's going to get the hook. If I still have a problem with the fish crushing it, I'm missing fish, or for whatever reason, I will go to a stinger hook. And I don't like throwing stinger hooks. One, it doesn't make the bait weedless. Two, when I started throwing stinger hooks, the conventional way to rig it was you either had a piece of surgical tubing or a piece of plastic that you would slide over the hook to keep it in place. But what happened is that hook still wasn't stationary. It would still swivel around. You'd take this stinger hook and you'd slide it on that hook and then you'd take a piece of surgical tubing, cut you a little piece or have a little piece of plastic and go on, stick it on the hook and this hook would swing side to side. If that fish came up and hit it sideways, this hook would turn sideways and literally keep that bait from going in its mouth and hooking it in a solid part of the mouth. I learned this little trick a few years ago from a friend. I'd use surgical tubing, but what I would do is I would measure and cut a piece of tubing the length I needed from where the body of the spinner bait was. I would measure down past the bend of the hook about a quarter of an inch. Then I would take my stinger hook and I would slide it into that tubing just about a quarter of an inch, a quarter to half, just like that. So now I have a piece of tubing and that stinger hook in there. Then I'm going to thread it onto the spinner bait. I'm going to run that hook right down that tubing. Make sure you go through the eye of the stinger hook. I've done that before. It's not a happy deal that you miss the eye. And you just kind of work that tubing right up onto the shank of that hook. <coughs> now what happens is you have a stinger hook that's rigid. I can go ahead and throw that against the bank. It can fold over and it's going to pop right back. Fish comes up sideways and grabs it it's more rigid. Chances are I'm going to get a piece of it. The only downside to it is it's not a totally weedless bait. Now, if I start dragging this through brush and I hesitate at all and let that bait roll over, I'm going to get hung up. As far as colors on spinner baits, normally 80% of the time I'm going to have a gold blade on that spinner bait. Spots definitely seem to prefer some type of gold blade. I feel I get more bites on it. If the water is a little bit stained, I'm going to have double gold blades on it. And again, the cleaner the water, the more translucent or transparent I want the skirt to make it look natural. The dirtier the water, the louder I want that skirt to appear. You know, if, it, if I only have a couple foot of visibility, I'll throw straight chartreuse. If it's four or five foot of visibility, I'm going to throw white and chartreuse. If I have six foot of visibility, I'll go to white. And if it's cleaner than that, I'll start going with my clear colored skirts. The other bit of advice I have for spotted bass is low light conditions on spinner baits. If there's not much sunlight out, if it's a real overcast day, I'll throw painted blades. If the water's fairly clean, I'll throw white blades. If it's fairly dirty, I'll throw chartreuse blades. That's the best bit of advice I can give you when spotted bass fishing with spinner baits. But again, I'll throw it on a fiberglass rod. Same thing. Reaction bait. Well, I appreciate you guys listening to me. If you have any questions on how I rig any of this or any of the equipment or baits, I'm going to be right over here at the Galaxy Marine booth. I'll throw all this stuff up, all my tackle up on the deck of that Triton over there, and you guys can dig through it and ask whatever questions you have. I appreciate it. Thank you.